It's a few minutes early, so I know that our online audience will be tuning in momentarily. They're probably waiting another two minutes for us to, to go live. Uh, I just want to say, and I can do some intro uh, discussion before as they're tuning in right now, that I'm always in search of a very short sermon series title. Not only just for it to be short, but that I also want it to convey a very powerful message uh, about what we'll, we will be studying in the coming weeks. This, team, this time, I think I set the record for brevity. Our series is entitled The Lit Series, so it's three letters. I don't know if I'll be able to beat that. Uh, that is a really short title. Um, this series, I named it The Lit Series because it's going to be on fire. It'll be lit. Uh, my wife warned me that the street definition today for lit <coughs> might mean something different than what I intended. I have no idea what that means in the street, uh, but what I mean, what I intend for it to mean is that it'll represent the Holy Spirit lighting up the beauty of Jesus Christ in the Word. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's get things lit as we open up our Bibles or turn in our apps to John chapter 1. We're only going to look at a few verses uh, together this morning because they are so weighty. And I'm going to need the Holy Spirit's help to really illuminate the truth because it is so difficult to really break this down because it's so deep. Um, it says in 1 John, or not 1 John, in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, I feel like a kid in a candy store. I don't even know where to begin with that statement. It is so weighty. Uh, it's simple but yet it is weighty. Uh, for starters, what John is doing in the first three verses that you might notice if you skip ahead, because I'm, I'm kind of one of those people that pay attention a little bit to what the teacher is saying, but I always kind of want to look ahead so I know it's coming before it even comes. Uh, if you're like me, maybe you already read a little bit ahead to verses two and three. But what John is doing in these first three verses is he wants to share immediately what took him three years to discover. He lived life on earth, walking with Jesus every day for three years. And it, it took him this long to discover the fullness of who Jesus was. But he doesn't want us to have to wait. He doesn't want to have some uh, a cliffhanger and build it up, and then finally, if you make your way through his gospel, you'll finally get it in the 20th chapter or something like that. He wants you to know right away in the first three verses what took him so long to find out. He wants our minds to understand at the beginning the eternal majesty, the deity, and the creator rights that belong to Jesus Christ. So spoiler alert, if you get through here and you say, well, what's the word? What's the word? The word is Jesus. If you keep reading, it becomes crystal clear in verse 14. Take a look at that. In verse 14, John doesn't want us to actually have a debate about what is he talking about? The Word was with God and the Word was God. It says in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You still might not get it if you stop there. People might have debated, well, is it this person? Is it that person? No, he says... Uh, uh, it, has dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory. The glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He'll actually say that grace came through Jesus Christ. And so there's all these different things that point us to the Word being Jesus. Um, the Word refers to Christ. John knows that in the next 21 chapters, he's got to tell the story of what Jesus did and also what he taught. And so, what is the first three words that he uses to begin his gospel with? It's very, very interesting. He says, in the beginning. Yes. Where have we heard that from before? No, it wasn't Star Wars. That's a long time ago in a galaxy far away, but it's a long time ago, but it wasn't the beginning. Uh, in fact, Genesis 1-1 is where we see that at, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So what John is saying here when he starts off with in the beginning was the word. Uh, he wants us to know 
that Jesus Christ created the universe. Creator rights belong to him. He was creating with God the Father. And the reason we know this is if you take the Greek Old Testament, the words in the beginning that are used in Genesis 1-1 in the Greek Old Testament is the exact same Greek words that John uses to start his gospel off. And he does this because he wants us to know that Jesus had no beginning. He was not created. He was creator, and he was there with God the Father. It says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God. One of the marks of this gospel, like I said earlier, is it's so weighty. It's, it's actually difficult to preach because it just, I mean, you have to have your coffee in the morning. I mean, it's not something that you just jump into at five in the morning. You got to alert and you have to be ready because it's so weighty. But John still uses the simplest words to communicate it. How many of us have uh, ever had a Jehovah's Witness um, Stop by and pay us a visit. <laughs> if you've ever gotten uh, a visit from a Jehovah's Witness, and if you haven't, you will. There's a few things that are certain in this world. They say uh, death, taxes, and a visit from a Jehovah's Witness at your front door when you're at your most busiest time uh, you could possibly be at. If you ever do have a visit, I want you to be prepared because there is an argument they'll make, and if you don't, know what the word teaches, you may fall for what they're trying to say. Um, they'll tell you, a Jehovah's Witness or even a Muslim will say to you that John's gospel here is a mistranslation, and they're, they're not correct when they say that. They say that it should read, that not that the word was God, they want to insert a word. They want to tell you that it should say the word was a God. I want to put the word A in there. But there's a right way if you study this out, even if you don't know Greek, to know that that is not correct. And I'll get into that in a moment. Um, and Jehovah's Witnesses will, they'll either, after you know this and you share this with them, they'll either stop visiting your house altogether, or even better yet, uh, they'll see the light because of your, your words will be lit with the truth through the power of the Holy Spirit, and they'll abandon their false religion. Either way, it's a win-win. i, I got to tell you, either way, it's a win-win. We used to get Jehovah's Witnesses visiting us all the way out here in the country all the time. They don't, they don't come so much anymore. Uh, it's kind of interesting. And now I've got, the, um, I've got a special doorbell where I can talk to them with the voice from above. <laughs> You want to talk about the word was a God, though. The word was God. Let's have a conversation through my doorbell. Um, but let's look at two other verses here, and then I'll, I'll get into the argument that will dismantle what they're trying to, to bring. It says in verse 2, He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So what John is getting at here, and I just want to put this out for you, and we can leave it up there for a while because we're going to get back to our Jehovah's Witness argument in a minute. What John is telling us is a few things about Jesus here. First of all, the time of his existence. You want to know when Jesus existed? Well, it's before all time, in the beginning. In the beginning, Jesus was already found because he wasn't created. Second thing is the essence of his identity. Who is this who is this person? Who is this man? Who is this guy? He's so different from anything we've experienced. It's the question that the world wrestled with. Well, John says he, he was God. Jesus was God, is God. And third, he wants us to know his relationship to God. The word was with, with God. He was with God the Father all along. Okay, so going back to... Your doorbell rings, or someone knocks at your door, and they've got a word for you, and they think that they're doing you a favor. And they say some form of brand of heresy from the 4th century. You can look at this and study it out, and maybe the History Channel or Smithsonian Channel might even cover it. Any of these, these realms within this theological standpoint comes from the 4th century. It's a heresy birthed out of that. 
And it says Jesus was not God, Jesus was not eternal, but rather Jesus was in fact created. That he was, and this is where they might trick you a little bit, they'll say something like this, he was the first of creation, he was the highest of the high angels. But John writes precisely in verse 3 in a way that will make that impossible. So don't fall for this baloney sandwich that the first thing God did was he made Jesus, and then he's like, all right, let's create things together. That is not true. John didn't stop with saying in verse 3, all things were made through him. He has something else to add. But you might think that just that first part of the verse would settle the argument. You might think that Jesus is saying Jesus is not a, uh, a creature. He created creatures, so case closed. But no, they're dogmatic. And what they will counter you with is this. They'll say, yes, but all things doesn't include himself. It includes everything but himself. So they'll try to tell you that he was created, that Jesus was created by the Father. Then the Father with Jesus created all other things. Well, here's why this is not correct. John doesn't stop with all things were made through him. He adds another line, and I love this. He says, I need a little help here. What, is it, what does it say? Without him, nothing, right? Nothing was made that has been made. So this is how the Jehovah's Witness argument is completely dismantled. Without him, nothing was made that was made. What do those final words that was made add to the meaning of without him uh, was not anything made? How does that change? How is that a game changer? Because anything, you can put anything in the category of made, anything that is made in this category, Christ made it, right? That's what it's saying. Anything in the category of made, Christ made it. Therefore, Christ was not made. Because if you've ever had a logic class, be, uh, before you exist, you can't bring yourself into being. <laughs> it doesn't work. If you didn't exist, you can't create yourself into existence. Uh, it's impossible. That's what this means, that Christ was not made. Um, and that's what it means to be God. And that's what it means when he says the word was God. Jesus is God. He was not created. So John 1.3 dismantles the Jehovah's Witnesses' ar argument that God the Father made Jesus. So as we progress in the text, let's look at verse 4 and 5, and those will be our last two verses that we focus on, and then we'll bring it all together, because they're all working in harmony together, especially at the end of verse 5, the first four verses. It says, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So there's our light slash lit portion of our text, talking about light. Um, and I love verse 5. It's what I would call the invincibility of light. Um, it says, darkness has not overcome it. Uh, another way you could label this is that light is triumphant over darkness. When you study out, do a word study in the Greek, you can understand uh, fuller, that light is triumphant over darkness is what John is saying, hence our sermon name. But the question has to be this. John, that's an interesting point that you made, but why does darkness not overcome light? Or better yet, how can we be sure that light will go on and completely overcome the darkness. Because i got to tell you, John, you didn't live in 2019. It's pretty dark. And I've got my doubts. I wonder, is light going to overcome darkness? Well, that's what the first four verses are written to. They will give you the reason why light triumphs over 
darkness. And maybe you've never caught that before. But before we get to the profound statement of verse 5, that light is triumphant over darkness, John wants us to be clear why that is. In verse 5, it says, light shines in the darkness. He means that the Word became flesh. That Jesus himself came into the dark world, and he is the light of the world. In John 8, 12, as you continue in his gospel, he actually, Jesus will say, I am the light of the world. And in chapter 1, verse 9, the true light, Jesus, that enlightens every man, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yes, he created it. But yet, here's the sad part. The world knew him not. He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. It's plain that Jesus is who John is talking about. Jesus is the light in verse 5. He is the one who shines in the darkness. Now, you might say, well, what is the darkness? Can you define the darkness? Well, I'll let John do it for, for me. In John 3, 19, he gets a little bit clearer on what he means by darkness and evil. Darkness is this world of evil and unbelief and death and judgment. In John 3, 19, it says, this is the judgment. And the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So darkness, and you can write this down because this helps when we understand light is triumphant over darkness. Well, what is darkness? Darkness is the power of evil and unbelief. So what verse 5 is saying is that Jesus Christ, the light of the world, has entered into the darkness of evil and unbelief and lostness and death. And he's done that, and the darkness will not overcome Jesus. Now that makes a tremendous difference for those who are in Christ, for those who believe. John 12, 46 says this, I've come as light into the world that whoever believes in me won't remain in this darkness. So believers, all of us who are in Christ, we have passed out of darkness and into light. And it gets better because John 12, 36 says, while you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. So not only did we pass from darkness into light, we also became partly of light. We are children of light. In fact, Paul says it this way. Once you were darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, Ephesians 5, 8. So it's clear, because I don't want to, I don't want to confuse people. Clearly, we have a free will. We have the ability to make a choice. Now, we, who we are in Christ, we are, in fact, children of light. That doesn't change. But we can act as hypocrites. We can act counter to who Christ made us to be. And we can do things that are contrary to who we are. We can have moments where we walk after the flesh and not after the spirit. We can do things that would be from uh, our former life, things that are, are dark, things that are evil, uh, even Christ followers have the ability to, to, have, uh, to, cho to choose to walk after the flesh. But it's not who we are. So if we do that, we're acting in a nature that is contrary to our true nature of who we are in Christ. It says the light shines in the darkness. Darkness has not overcome it, overcome it. And so that means that the light, the light will triumph. And that means Jesus will triumph. And that means that all who believe in him, the children of light, will triumph. And we need to hear that today because it is a, a dark world in America that we live. And it seems like darkness is gaining ground on all numerous fronts in our land. But light is triumphant over darkness. The darkness has not, the darkness will not ever overcome the light of Jesus Christ. And you can say, well, Pastor Matt, how do you know? And here's the reason John is clear. 
He gives us three, three reasons why this is true. And I'm going to make this very practical because up until this point, it has been very much a theological statement. And you can go, well, okay, that's wonderful, but what does it mean for my life and what do I do because of it? We'll get to that if you can hold on long enough for me to get through this because it's so weighty, I said. The first point is that the light is the light of the sun. That's what John 1.4 is all about. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The first reason that light will triumph over darkness is because, uh, because of this very point, that it is a living light. The light of Christ is alive. Um, it does not overcome it because this light has energy and purposefulness and growth and reproduction. It's not a static type of light. It's not like a stoplight that you could just ignore it or that it could just go out at any minute because it's got some kind of failure, power failure. The light shines in the world today because it is the very light of the Son of God. It's eternal. It wasn't created. It, had no, it has no beginning, and it has no end. So even if the world continues to get darker and darker, that light will shine brighter and brighter, and it will never be extinguished. It'll never be overcome because it is the very light of Jesus Christ. Some might question, well, maybe the powers of darkness are just as strong as his life. There's another uh, religion that teaches that, teaches that Jesus and Satan are brothers and equal powers, and then you can get into weirdness of, you know, yin and yang and opposite forces, and this, there's a equal, the, there's this good and there's equal bad, and everything's a perfect balance. Well, I got to tell you that that's all bunk because um, the powers of darkness are not as strong as his life. Mm -hmm. And that is the second reason of why we can be assured that light will triumph over darkness. If they were 50-50, we would have no assurance. And I'm going to show you why this is true. And there's an argument people make that is flawed, and I want to share that too as well. So the life, second point, the life is the life of the creator of all things. That's what John is saying. So... All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So the point is this. The energetic, purposeful, growing, reproductive life that shines in the darkness is the life of none other than the creator of all things. And that life shines the light of life, is the light of life that shines as a creator. So how do we know? How do we know? Because a lot of people, well, a lot, there are many, many people believe that Satan is as powerful as Jesus, and, and the powers of evil and the powers of good are they're just clashing, and who knows how it's going to turn out. How do we know that light will triumph? Because no created thing, no created thing is more powerful than its creator. And even the angels, the fallen angels, God created. Lucifer, Satan, was created. He is not as powerful as his creator. So here's a counter argument, because if you get someone who thinks they're very deep, they're gonna go, they're gonna go here. And then you'll be ready for it. And then you'll make them look foolish, silly. They'll say, Well, isn't the atom bomb more powerful than the men who created it? And I would say, yes, I'm not stronger than the atom bomb. If the atom bomb went off right now, I'm pretty certain if I wasn't very, very far away from it, I would perish, right? And you'd say, well, and they say, well, can't the atom bomb destroy its maker? Again, I'd say, yes, it can. I remember one time a vacuum cleaner salesperson came to my house, and they offered me a free demonstration, and they used the same kind of logic on me. They would ask me some questions, which were obvious yes statements, because they were leading me to say yes to the question they wanted me to really say yes to. So they came out, and they did this demonstration, and they said, well, do you like your house to be clean? And I should have been a smart aleck and said, no, you know, it's all good. I like dirty, dirty house. But I said, yeah, I'll play along. I said, yes, I like my house to be clean. 
said, well, did this, uh, did this vacuum help your house become clean? Yes, it did. They said, well, do you, do you like your family to be healthy? <laughs> yes, I like my family to be healthy. I prefer them to be healthy as opposed to being really sick. So did this vacuum cleaner remove dust particles that could make your family sick? Yes. The final question, do you want to buy the world 5000 because you love your family and you want them to be healthy? And I said, no. <laughs> And she looked at me like, well, that's not how they taught me in the training program of what you would say. You left out some key uh, factors. The world of Matic 5000 isn't the only thing that can pick up dust particles in my house. In fact, at Walmart, they sell something similar, and it's $500 cheaper than what you're trying to sell me right now. So no, I don't want the world of Matic. Thank you for your time. Um, couldn't believe it. I, it must, I must have been their first house because she was shocked at my response. No, I don't want this thing. Um, but this is similar to the atom bomb argument. Okay? Can you make things more powerful? Can people make things that are more powerful than them? The answer? Yes. Like the vacuum cleaner, right? Um, yes, we could make bombs. We could make guns. We could make the thigh master. All of these things are stronger than we are. It's materials that already existed that we form and we fashion, we put together, are stronger than us. There's, there's a whole list. It doesn't even have to be something that would kill us. It's just stronger. Can you destroy it? Can you break it? Or could someone hit you with it continuously and it could hurt you? Yes. I mean, there is just so many things that we could create that could destroy us. However, the difference is this. Making a bomb out of materials that already exist in the universe and are controlled by laws that you and I didn't write is completely different than God creating something out of nothing. Uh, if you can make something out of nothing, you can always turn that something into nothing if you really wanted to. And therefore, the creator always has the upper hand. If he wanted to destroy evil, boom, it could be destroyed like that. But there's a purpose in what is happening here, right, right here, right now on our planet. You re, I don't even have time to get into it because it's so deep theologically, but it's in the Word of God of why evil exists and why it, he hasn't wiped it out yet. It has to do with his grace and his mercy. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to, be, to believe and be saved. And so he's in his mercy and his, his grace, he's waiting and giving people an opportunity to respond to the gospel. Doesn't mean everybody will, and we know that that's true. But that's why he hasn't inter intervened yet. But there is coming a day, there is a judgment coming where evil has its day. So uh, it's, it's good to know that. But the, going back to the argument, there's nothing powerful enough in the created universe that would destroy the Creator God. What do you think the atom bomb is going to do to God? He made everything, He made the whole universe. You think the atom bomb is going to touch God? No. So when we put ourselves in the argument and say, well, <laughs> a created thing, humans, could create something that already exists, the elements are there, put it together and it could kill them. That means that God could be create, killed or harmed by something in creation. No. He is too powerful. And so the light shines in the darkness. The darkness can't overcome the light. Because the light is the light is energetic, purposeful, growing, reproducing light. And second, it's the light through whom everything made, including the angelic powers that fell into darkness, came to be. They were created by God, even the angels. The last point, because we're running out of time here, is the light and life is God. That's John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God. It means that there are distinct persons that can fellowship with one another. Uh, the Word was God, meaning that there is one God, not two gods. This is the mystery of the Trinity. Uh, and we hold fast to this biblical mystery that there's God the Father and God the Son, and they have such unity that they are one God, not two. Uh, in fact, and they also have the Holy Spirit that would make uh, conclude the Trinity. 
So concluding with all this, because this is so weighty, you probably want to replay this message later uh, after you have some more coffee and after you think about this a little bit more because this is so deep. Um, what do I do with all this? And how can this be practical in my life? So I would say, I start with this. What do I do with this info? And here's a real easy part. Be of good cheer. There's a lot of darkness in the world. There's, you turn on the news and your heart is going to break. Um, uh, just this past week, I don't want to get into it too deep, but even things that weren't done intentionally, like a two-year-old falling in a well and dying, just broke my heart. Um, there has been so many tragedies and evil things going on and things that weren't even intentional, but we live in a fallen world, and it can just become so disheartening. But what do I do with everything in John 1? Be of good cheer, because the light cannot be overcome by darkness, because the light is alive. It's the light of life. Through this light, this living word, all things were made, and this living word is God. So be of good cheer. John 16, 33 says, Christ has overcome the world of darkness. Believe in the light. that You may become sons of the light. And I love this. We have victory in Jesus. It's time that we go into the world as victors. That we go into the world with the promise that darkness will not overcome the light. Um, and we go as the children of light. So here's a practical thing, example from my life. Um, I was very, very close to completely shutting down my social media presence. Not that I have a huge social media presence, but like on Facebook, for instance, I was getting so discouraged by the trolls that are out there, the negativity, the false reports. I remember I, I got engaged in something that wasn't even political. It was it was like a statement of uh, like a like a prayer, you know, that that God would. I don't even remember exactly how it went, but it was along the lines of you know God opening up people's hearts and that that people would pray for God's wisdom that that. That God would continue, that God would guide leaders in this nation and things like that. It wasn't a political statement. It wasn't Democrat, Republican, Republican, Independent, anything. It was just God, give us wisdom. And man, I got ripped for that. And it went like all weird ways and everything. And I'm like, man, this is just insane. And I don't even know if this is making a difference. Maybe it's just I got to get off this for my own health. So I was close to actually shutting down Facebook altogether. But then my wife reminded me of some positive things, right? That you get to see what family's doing. You get to share pictures. You get to encourage people, et cetera, et cetera. And it went even beyond that, and I'm glad. Because when we know that we're children of light, and that it's a dark world, and there's darkness all around us, we go as the victors, like I said. I don't need to just shut it down. What I need to do is I need to bring the light into the dark places. And i got to tell you that Facebook's got some darkness to it. And so what we've done instead is we said, let's bring the light of the world, Christ, into Facebook. And hello, we're on Facebook Live right now. And I know that we're a small group, but we're growing. And I'm going to, I got to tell you that I see it as an opportunity because people are on there and people are searching and they're getting more discouraged and there's more darkness put into their world based upon trolls and, and negativity and whatever. But man, when the Acts 433 can share the gospel of God's grace and let that light shine, man, that can save a life, that can change a life. And that is what it means that we are children of light. And the darkness will not overcome it. And so i got to tell you, in your life, look for those opportunities, whatever they are, to be strong, to be create, courageous, to be of good cheer, to know the promise of Jesus that he has overcome the darkness. And so we go, we go with victory. So with that being said, let's bow our heads. and Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word.
um, I thank you that even though this was extremely weighty, it's real practical because I, I got to believe that someone's going to be, once the weather changes, which this next week is pretty crazy in Michigan, but once the weather gets a little nicer, our doorbell is going to ring. And there's going to be someone standing there that thinks that they know the truth, that they know the answer. And they're going to say something along the lines that uh, the word was a God. And man, the light bulb should go off. No, no, no. Jesus was not created. He is creator. He is God. And he was with God. And I'm going to show you verse 3 that talks about how nothing was made. Uh, not, uh, everything that was created, uh, that he created everything and nothing was made that wasn't made. So Christ himself was not created. So everything you bought into and believed has not been the truth. I'm going to set this person free. And that's one way that in a dark place where someone's spiritually blind, we could shine the light. Lord, I know it's not our responsibility uh, as to what transpires in that person's life. We have no power of ourselves. It's through the Holy Spirit. But, Lord, we've got opportunities all the time. I know Facebook was kind of a, a large-scale thing. And it's not even not a one-on-one -on -one personal interaction. It's more of a group thing. But we all, we go as children of light. And we encounter different people. And we can let that light shine in a lot of different ways. But Lord, I pray if people get anything from this message, that they will be of good cheer. That they won't be as come discouraged when they don't see the results that they're hoping for as they let their light shine. Because the promise is the darkness will not overcome it. This work is going to work, and it's going to make a difference. And Lord, ultimately, in the end, we will see it, and we'll know it, and we'll celebrate, and we'll say all the glory to God, because it was His work, His work in through us. Lord, I thank you that in the, our church, I feel right now, and this is going to become more clear in the near future, but you're setting the tables for us to have an even greater platform to use. Uh, Lord, I do believe that there are groups of people that tune in that have a calling on their life in their community that we couldn't reach. They can, but we can help them reach them. And I'll ex I, I know that you're going to help me explain that clearer soon. But Lord, I thank you for those that are tuning in. I thank you that you have a calling, and I think that you're getting them ready for something amazing ahead that they didn't even see. So, Lord, help us with wisdom. Take the right steps of faith to make that plain and help people. Help people have a platform to really let their light shine. But I thank you for all you've done. I thank you for the blessings in our lives. We give you all the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.